Hi and welcome again to Dentlinks. I'm Peter Tawil and it's my pleasure to present to you a case that we have treated in our facility. It is a full mouth maxillary and mandibulary uh, rehabilitation with dental implants and bone graft. Uh, the nice and interesting part of this case is that we have a five year uh, post op recall on it and it will be my pleasure to present it to you. Let's start in with the patient presentation. She's a 65 year old female with a non significant past medical history. Her chief complaint is broken teeth, pain in her jaw and her teeth, and ill fitting dentures, and she wanted a new smile. Upon radiological uh, analysis, you can uh, clearly see. Uh, that uh, obviously she has caries and dental plaque in her mouth so she has a bilateral posterior edentulism in the maxilla and in the mandible is a partial edentulism you will see the x-rays later on uh, she has fractured teeth she has periapical abscesses rotten roots in the posterior left area and hopeless teeth in the maxillary anterior teeth she has a uh, Portion infused to metal crowns, uh, periodontal lesions, pockets, mobile dentition, pneumatized sinuses, and you can clearly see it on the x ray on the upper right and upper left sides, uh, and insufficient uh, sub sinus height. And in the maxillary premolar area, she has an inf insufficient bone width. For implant placement. So the treatment plan was as follow: extract all remaining maxillary teeth except the lateral incisors to retain a bar retained over denture for the interim phase. We tend to prefer having some kind of a tooth supported denture in the interim phase if possible uh, to avoid the direct pressure on the wound and the healing implants. So it's better to have a bar retained over denture than a full over the or full denture that create less or try to diminish the pressure on the healing uh, grafts and implants. First, uh, we uh, access the maxillary left side and do a sinus lift. Eventually, also in the same visit, um, augment horizontally the premolar area, the canine area, in the maxillary left area and also implant uh, two center incisor with a guided bone regeneration of course we will show you everything uh, following visit will uh, will be a maxillary sinus lift in the upper right area and then block graft uh, autogenous block graft is our preference in the premolar right premolar area wait obviously six months for the grafts to heal Implants placement in the molar, first molar side or second molar side, depending on the bone quality. Uh, Premolar area or canine. Also adding one more on the lateral incisor area. Wait four months, abutment connection, and uh, finish up the case with a portion infused to metal retained bridge on seven implants and try to split it in two parts. So let's sum up our treatment plan on the, uh, this current slide. You can see, first of all, we extracted the two central incisor and the retained hopeless dentition, and we kept only the two lateral incisor. This is to show you just what is going on radiologically in comparison to the clinical situation. You have a pneumatized sinus on the upper right side, a deficient uh, premolar area and width, you have a pneumatized sinus on the left and a deficient uh, area bone width in the premolar area and two central incisors that are, have been extracted. We kept the two laterals for the bar retained over denture. So to sum up the treatment plan, we have a block graft, it is uh, our first surgery on the upper right upper left uh, area, sinus lift in the upper left area, 
two implants in the central incisor plus SGBR. This will be the first surgical appointment. Then follows up another appointment to do a notogenous block graft in the premolar area, sinus lift in the upper left area, and let it heal for six months. Then place four implants in the molar and premolar sites. This could be done in the same visit. This is after the bone graft heals. And then after these implants heal again, we will add one more implant in the lateral incisor. And this to be able to split the bridge properly into two parts. It's uh, better to do seven implants to be able to split the bridge in two different parts. It's better for prosthetic rehabilitation. So let's address first the upper left quadrant in which we uh, drew a full thickness flap with a mid cluster incision, a full thickness flap, and access the upper posterior quadrant. First, uh, doing an access window for the sinus, external sinus lift. This was done using the piezo surgery unit. As you see, a very clear rectangular window is drawn from the buccal plate and access to the sinus mucosa. You can see some parts of the PSSA artery, which is clearly seen here. The reflection of the sinus mucosa was done without any perforation. We were able to fill in a xenograft material in the sinus. We then proceeded with the implants in the two central incisor position. As you see, very well placed according to the three-dimensional position. It is in a palatal inclination and the emergence is more or less in the cingulum of the teeth. Uh, a clear missing buccal plate which will be augmented using a guided bone regeneration. We accessed the mandibular left retromolar area with a semicircular incision and a full thickness flap. We then uh, harvested autogenous bone and grafted parts of it as a first layer in the missing buckle plate of the central incisors. Then obviously augmented the rest about two to three millimeters of thickness using a xenograft. We covered the whole uh, augmentation using a collagen membrane. What we com completed next was de decorticating the recipient site of the autogenous block graft. This is the canine area here, clearly missing sufficient bone width to withstand an implant. And with the same incision we did to access the retromolar area, we uh, then uh, harvested the autogenous block graft from that area using the piezo surgery unit. It is a block graft, it's about uh, 17 to 18 millimeters of length and about uh, 7 to 8 millimeters of width and a thickness of about 2 to 3 millimeters. This is the proper adaptation of the autogenous block graft to the recipient site. This is uh, after decorticating the block graft and fixating, fixating it with two screws. These, these are ustomed screws. And uh, this is showing uh, clearly the thickness of the graft and the proper filling of the space that is uh, present in between the graft and the recipient bed. We tend to fill it with autogenous bone chips that is harvested using a scraper. This is a scraper, safe scraper. And <clears throat> with this graft, you can, uh, with this picture, you can clearly see the implants in the front the block graft in the middle and the sinus lift in the back, all done in the same visit um, to reduce as much as possible the amount of surgery done in the patient. 
This is showing you the space that is in between the craft and the recipient bed that we fill in totally and proper tuck in the bone, endogenous bone chips underneath it. We fill the voids to accelerate the healing. This is another uh, clear photograph showing you the thickness that was restored in that site and the, um, the, the graft in the back. We also grafted the sockets of the molars to gain some uh, good quality of bone while entering back. This is another close-up view after filling the voids. We covered the sinus uh, reposition window with a collagen fleece, which is a fast resolvable collagen membrane. And uh, the front area, the implant, uh, GBR area was, co was covered with the slower resolvable collagen membrane that uh, resolves at six to eight weeks. And the block graft was also covered with a fast resolving collagen uh, membrane, which is a collagen fleece by Botis. Flaps were then sutured, tension free, and this is the donor site in the mandibular left area. And this is the x ray showing the perfect parallelism of two centers incisors. And then we have the block graft that is decorticated too, because the quality of that bone is usually very cortical in the retromolar area. So we tend to decorticate also the graft. And this is showing the posterior area that was filled in with the xenograft while doing the sinus lift. So we did uh, about the same thing on the contralateral side. This is the next surgery that was done about a month later or so, or three weeks later, you can see the the flaps are still healing on the upper left side. So we accessed in the same way, mid crested incision and a full thickness flap, uh, accessing the sinus window with about the same technique. It's the reposition window technique that we have published about. You can, you can check out the article in our page. This is the sinus window, uh, sinus membrane that was reflected without any perforation, as you see here, a clear decortication of the recipient bed in the premolar area. And this is to enhance angiogenesis and the healing of the graft. The same technique was applied to the site too. We accessed the retromolar area and harvested a block that was about uh, the same size as the other one, a, a bit thinner on that side. This is uh, two to three millimeters thin, a bit thinner than the other one. Same technique was applied, decortication of the, of the block and uh, first we adapt uh, the block with uh, putting on some autogenous bone chips. This is for better adaptation of the block when we screw it in. These were screwed in with two Ustomed screws. We then filled in the sinus with uh, the xenograft material. Sinus window was then repositioned as you see here and stabilized with the collagen fleece which is a fast resolvable collagen membrane and uh, the voids were filled in also uh, between the block graft and the recipient bed and flap was then sutured, tension free. We then have the block graft. This is the radiograph showing the block graft and the sinus lift in the back. And we allowed the whole thing to heal for about six months. During the six months, the patient was functioning on an overdenture retained with a bar between the two lateral incisors. This is the bar. At six months, we can uh, see the recall. The flaps were well healed. However, she, she did have some sort of an abscess on the upper right side. When we reopened the site, we had an infection. And um, the upper right or the sinus lift site 
in the uh, maxillary right side. However, a good amount of bone was created posterior to that lesion. So we were able to, um, to place an implant and we will show you how we did this. As you, as you can see here, some of the grafted bone uh, was resorbed. This is another uh, clear uh, radiograph, uh, photograph sorry, showing the resorption of about 2 millimeters in thickness of that block graft. And uh, the reason why we had this could be from the, the denture. The denture was obviously being used. However, the flange was taken out, but the patient still, you know, functioned quite normally on it. And the pressure from this denture caused this kind of pressure. So in the upper right quadrant, we were able to squeeze in two implants as planned. However, the posterior one was left a bit more posterior to the second molar site. The area of the abscess was corrected properly, filled in with another biomaterial, xenograft, and covered with a collagen membrane. <clears throat> this is showing you the two implants in place. In the upper left quadrant, the same uh, access was done. However, here, a better healing with uh, no resorption of the block graft and an excellent healing in the sinus area. We were able to squeeze in two uh, nicely placed implant as you see here this is the front one and this is the uh, posterior area flaps were then sutured on both sides this is all done in the same appointment and then allowed to heal again for about four months you see uh, the denture has been also is some part of the adhesive uh, because the patient was complaining of the mobility of the, the, the denture and she couldn't talk properly since we didn't uh, let her have any flange in it. So no mucosal support. At four months, abutment connections were done. We then extracted one of the latter's incisor and uh, this is the showing you the very nice reconstruction we had in the front or two center incisors uh, implant we added one more implant in the lateral side so that uh, we will be able to uh, divide the bridge in, in, in two parts and have seven implants this is the upper left side the re-entry a very good result however you can see here in the posterior area the bone quality was not that great plus the pressure from the denture uh, aggravated the situation and created this resorption around that implant that we treated with a guided bone regeneration and a membrane these are the flaps sutured abutment connection was done on four implants and the implant in the posterior left area that had to be regrafted was covered and obviously the implant was added in the lateral incisor inside 12 was also covered Three months later, we completed the final abutment and you can see here a very nice band of keratinized tissue and a good angulation of the implants and a good integration of the pink scores or the gingival integration was perfectly done. We then proceeded with the fabrication of the final a portion fused to metal retain maxillary bridge and this is at insertion a very nice result with a very natural looking like um, a ceramic and a nice integration and blending with the soft tissue this is the maxillary bridge in place as you see as you can clearly see she's still functioning with the mandibular partial denture and a couple of remaining natural dentition um, this is the integration of the bridge and a nice blending of the colors and a nice uh, gingival contour as you see here but this is at day one at insertion in a beautiful 
obviously fitting of the maxillary denture. This is uh, about three years later, where uh, the recession on the premolar area was starting to be a bit more aggravated, and we decided to thicken the gingival tissues in that area because of the fact that she was lacking of proper keratinized tissues. We decided first to go with the connective tissue graft after decontaminating the surface of the implant. And this was done using a tunneling technique uh, in the vertical motion, where we slid the connective tissue harvested from the pallet, autogenous, and uh, stabilized it with two uh, five zero vicryl sutures. This is uh, show, showing you the stabilization of the CT graft. And waited one more year, as you see, uh, thickening obviously of the keratinized uh, tissue, but the color is still a bit showing. And uh, on the on the lateral uh, incisor, uh, we have also a bit of the um, color of the implants, the color of the restoration that is uh, showing. We then decided three years after the first surgery to regraft, but this doing it in a tunneling technique that is horizontal. We grafted um, a connected tissue graft, slide it, and position the apical, uh, coronally uh, uh, position uh, the flap with the connected tissue graft. And this is the result five years post operative. So, obviously, we have no new challenges. We have another recession on the maxillary canine site. Now it's hard to convince the patient to go again with another CT graft, even though you see the, the problem. Uh, this obviously is a, a challenge and the graft, the, the area needs to be thickened with the connective tissue graft again. So we always uh, learn from um, the, the healing at five years and ten years and on the long term healing because at day one everything looks perfect and uh, the tissues look great but with time with thin tissues we learn that we need to thicken properly the tissues at the base from day one so uh, showing you that uh, a connective tissue needs to be done here on the upper left side however this, the result is very satisfying to the patient still. She had a small ceramic chip on the upper right maxillary lateral incisors. But, um, however, she's very satisfied. She has a low smile line and does not show these uh, small imperfections in the gingival aspect. Uh, she maintains inadequate hygiene uh, in, the, uh, in the maxilla as well as in the mandible. You can see here in the x-ray, in the photograph, sorry, that she has been restored with the full overdenture retained on implants. And I will show you uh, in a few slides what we completed in the mandible. I'll just finish up with the maxilla. So uh, overall situation is still very stable. However, a small gingival recession on the canine area. The tissues are very thin. We need to thicken them properly. And the area that was thickened in the upper right area, upper right uh, quadrant, uh, is holding on very well. In this next section, we will discuss the step-by-step -step approach of the treatment of the mandible. This is the panoramic film showing the remaining teeth that are in bad condition, a comb beam CT analysis uh, showing uh, the deficiency in the posterior mandible, a deficiency of bone in the, in the width of the bone, so the, uh, the patient is a good candidate for this kind of approach, the all-on-four protocol. She was uh, functioning on a partial denture, and the remaining dentition was either carried or had a poor periodontal prognosis. We extracted all remaining teeth, except the second molar, for VDO purposes. A mid-crestal incision was done, and two distal vertical releasing incisions to access properly the posterior aspect of the mandible. 
after a full thickness uh, mucoperiosal flap elevation is completed, we identify the mental nerve foramina, and this is to position our distal implant properly. We then redu reduce the bone peaks with uh, the use of rongers, and it's a good technique to be able to harvest some autolo auto autologous bone. This is an occlusal view showing uh, some deficiency in width in the posterior mandible. So what we do is correct the alveolar ridge using a surgical burr, and by reducing the height of bone, we gain some width to be able to place an adequate size implant. And this is showing the reduction using the surgical burr. In this area, in the lower left area, it was the most needed. So this is the ridge right after flattening it with the surgical burrs, inadequate uh, width to place implants. We start with the anterior drilling. The two anterior implants are in the uh, lateral incisor sites. The two posteriors are at second premolar sites. We drill it at 30 degrees following the all-on-4 protocol. So the emergence of the second premolar goes into the first molar. This is inserting the first implant, a 13 by 3.75 Nobel parallel conical implant with an excellent 35 Newton centimeters torque. This is the second implant placed with also an excellent insertion torque at 35 Newton. That allows us immediate loading. All four implants placed, as you see the two front in the laterals and the posterior implants in second premolar side at 30 degrees angle. We then uh, place some bone graft into the buckle gap and connect directly the multi-unit abutments. This is the placement of impression copings, suturing of flaps. Then we take an immediate plaster impression right away at surgical time, this is the healing caps in place. And this is a pan direct panoramic x-ray right after surgery. In 10 days later, we have a final prosthesis that is inserted and functional. Patient is advised not to eat hard food on it. Final panoramic x-ray after the extraction of the second molar. And this is about uh, two and a half months later where we did a small re-veneering of the prosthesis because of the gingival uh, contour being different. However, the patient was very satisfied with her immediate function. This is the five year uh, in the maxilla uh, recall, x-ray, and in the lower uh, mandible, we have the uh, all on four in place, an excellent radiologic result, and uh, a very stable bone on all implants and I thank you all for your attention.